But okay, what are we doing? We're doing the, th- the things of the Spirit. We're in week eight of the things of the Spirit, which means we're talking about God, not how to recover from a hangover, not that kind of spirit. Let's do a quick recap. So we started off this series talking about the 10 works of the Spirit. Then the second week, we looked at um, the relational presence of God, that the, the story of the Bible is God's Spirit coming closer and closer, restoring what we had lost in the first place. Then we started to look at the idea of spiritual gifts, that the Holy Spirit comes to empower us with his gifts. Then we have been looking at specific gifts. So we looked at the gift of prophecy on one week. Then we looked at, we bundled some gifts together. So we looked at the, the word of exhortation, the word of wisdom, and the word of knowledge. Then the following week, we looked at uh, faith, healing, and, and miracles. Those three kind of went together nicely. And then last week, we looked at tongues and interpretation. And all of those sermons, they're on our website. Uh, they're on iTunes podcast. They're on YouTube. So check those out. And then uh, today, we're continuing on. And we're, we're looking at, um, we're packaging actually four different gifts together today. We're looking at the gifts of helping, gifts of mercy, gift of giving, and the gift of administration or administrating. And these gifts, they're, they're a little different. Um, and we're going to get into how they're different, uh, but they're no less important and no less valuable and no less inspired and empowered by the Holy Spirit than the other gifts that we've been looking at. So let's uh, pray, and then let's get into this. Lord, we know you're a God of the impossible. And so we just pray next time that the Bears would make it in the playoffs. But in all seriousness, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you would empower us with your gifts. And as each week we've been going through this series, that we would have increasing faith, increasing understanding, and increasing permission to step out in the powerful works that you have for us. Whatever the gifts you give us may be, that we would have faith to step out in those things. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the Apostle Peter, he um, delineates, kind of puts spiritual gifts into two big buckets. And he talks about gifts of, or speaking gifts and serving gifts. And this is not the only way to categorize the gifts, but this is one way to do it. And so in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, he says this. He says, as each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is... God's word. So we see he talks about anyone who speaks by the, essentially by the Spirit of God, hey, to speak as one who speaks the oracles of God. There, there, there are communica- communicative gifts, excuse me, and we've already looked at a lot of these, right? Gift of prophecy would be the biggest one, word of wisdom, word of exhortation, even tongues and inter- interpretation. These are speaking gifts, communicating gifts. But then he gives this other category of serving gifts. And the Bible mentions things like helping, mercy, giving, and administrating, these kinds of serving gifts. And that's what we're looking at today is gifts of service. So let's jump into this first one, uh, the gift of helping, the gift of helping. Or sometimes it's just translated as the gift of serving. And of course, we're all called to serve. But this particular gift, um, it means to to aid or uh, or to support someone essentially in a practical way. It's not a very complicated gift to understand. You, you probably know if you've got this gift. You're, you're a big helper. You like to help people. Uh, but this gift is mentioned alongside really big gifts, even like the gift of apostleship. So in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, we have this verse, verse 28. It says, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, Helping, mentions it right there, administrating and various kinds of tongues. So the person who's gifted in, that's where it, one of the references in the Bible that clearly identifies a gift of helping. When um, we're thinking about someone with this gift, they're not necessarily going to have all the skills necessary 
to help anyone in every circumstance. So it's not that somebody with the gift of helping can, they can repair your car and they can bake a cake and they can just step in, they can do your taxes for you. Like, uh, that'd be a, that would be an exceptional gift of helping. Um, but what this really means is that somebody, they have the impulse, the desire, the innate kind of motivation, just they, they want to make a difference, they want to help you out if you need help in some regard. And probably they intuitively know the best way that they can help. So they may not have all the skills, but they, they, they've got a feeling or a, a sense about how they can help. And I know, I know I'm greatly blessed when people help me in my, in my times of greatest need, especially when I run out of toilet paper. It's a great gift of helping right there. Person's gonna get a lot of rewards for that, whoever's there to help, I'm sure you feel the same way. Notice in this verse we read that it says that these, this gift is appointed in the church. So in the same way that the gift of apostleship or prophets or teachers, these other gifts are appointed in the church. Well, the gift of helping, this is appointed in the church. Now, of course, this gift can display itself anywhere. You, know, you, you don't have to be in a church context or in part of a church community to help someone else. You can use it absolutely anywhere. But this has been given especially, in particular, to be something that is a blessing to God's people, a blessing to fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so it needs to be recognized and honored and used. And of course, depending on the level of gifting, you know, some people um, might have a, have a, a much broader vision of using their gift of helping a kind of a larger ministry kind of way. That could be certainly true. Or it could be that the others are just, they just love the one-on-one, -on -one, like I just love helping this person and this person, whatever way, practical way I can help, I want to do it in that way. So there's different ways to see this gift working and operating. But because it's appointed in the church, it's important to use that gift in a unifying way, in a way that's in alignment with church ministry, in alignment with how others are serving, how others are operating on the overall direction of the ministry to make sure this gift is shining brightly and building up the church to help others. And somebody with this gift is going to have a lot of joy in serving, a lot of fruit. It's going to, it's going to be easy for them to, to help uh, and to serve others around them. And if you're this way, if you get a prompting or just a motivation or a sense like, I need to help that person, or you, know, you, you hear something or see something and your, your gut response is, how can I help? then you should know that that's the Holy Spirit empowering you to do it. Just as somebody gets a prompting to, to prophesy, or the Holy Spirit puts, puts you know, revelation on, on somebody's heart to speak, or a dream comes to somebody, just whatever, however the Holy Spirit works, just know the gift of helping, if it's being prompted, you're being nudged by the Holy Spirit. Hey, it's the same Spirit empowering that gift to, to help others. The only time you don't use this gift is at midnight when somebody asks you to move a big, large, black bag out of their trunk. That's the only time. What about the gift of mercy? Now, the gift of mercy, this really overlaps with the gift of helping. Quite challenging to kind of differentiate them. They're very, very similar, the gift of mercy to the gift of helping, but there might be some nuance to it. Um, the gift of mercy, this, this also can be referred to as the gift of compassion or even the gift of charity, could be referred to in that way, gift of charity. But this is concerned about people's well-being and about alleviating the suffering that people face. And so in, we have an example of this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. It says, Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. So this is the, what the gift of mercy looks like. Jesus is displaying to us the gift of mercy. Of course, Jesus has all the gifts. And this is about looking at people's circumstances and not wanting people to succumb to the, what, might, what we might perceive as the inevitable outcome of difficulty. Regardless of if somebody, you know, somebody's worthiness, doesn't matter even if they brought, brought the difficulty on themselves or... Whatever it is, it's, it's looking at somebody's plight and somebody's circumstances. Say, I want to alleviate that somehow. somehow. I want to have mercy on them and, and help them climb out of that, help them out of that, that, that problem in some way. And because and, and, 
we know that none of us deserve a good life, right? None of us, you know, we can feel entitled at times, but if, if we're honest and wise, we know, like, I don't deserve anything I have. Everything I have is, is a gift by God's grace. So mercy is just extending that, that unconditional kindness to people in their, in their darkest, neediest moment. And this gift is listed alongside other big gifts, so we see it in, I think it's Romans 12, Romans 12, verse 8, it says, The one who exalts in his exaltation. We looked at that, right, a few weeks ago, the gift of exaltation. The one who contributes in generosity. Talk about gift of giving in just a second. The one who leads with zeal. And then the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So this is where the Bible specifically mentions the gift of mercy. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now, we've got to pay attention to when these gifts are mentioned and how they're described and the kind of words that are used why is it that the Apostle Paul here in this passage says that the gift of mercy needs to be with, compa- with um, what did it say? With cheerfulness. <laughs> Why in particular cheerfulness? I think that when we're, when we're showing compassion, when we're showing mercy to people, we really we do have to cultivate that sense of cheerfulness in our own spirits, that sense of joy in doing it because it's hard to maintain mercy and compassion over a long period of time because of, some, because of something that we would, it's not a biblical phrase, but it's a phrase today, compassion fatigue. You've probably heard of compassion fatigue. That you just care so much, you give so much, and you help so much that you just get burned out. You just can't give anymore. And how tragic for somebody who really loves to, to show mercy and really loves to help, but they just they don't have the boundaries they need, or, or somebody takes advantage of that, and then they take too much from somebody. They, they demand too much. And the person doesn't know how to draw appropriate barriers or boundaries around that. And so because of compassion fatigue, we, we, we know that we, we, we've got to find a way to express mercy in a way that we can sustain that throughout our lives because there's, we're never going to lack opportunities to show mercy to people. People are always in need. There's always great tragedy in the world. People always have great loss or pain in their lives and they need, or or great difficulty, and they need mercy in that moment. But because when you pour out and you pour out, you pour out, if you get burned out, if you get disillusioned, if you get tainted by it, then you can't give any mercy anymore. And so to to give mercy with cheerfulness, to find find the strength from the Holy Spirit to say, Holy Spirit, give me the joy of of showing showing mercy to someone so I don't expect anything back from them, but also to do it in a way that I've got got clear boundaries so that I get filled back up myself, that's the way to go about showing mercy. Jesus, in one of his most famous parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know, he, he tells this story, right, of the man who fell amongst the robbers and different people pass by, and then the question comes, who was the neighbor? Who was actually the neighbor to the man who fell by robbers? And the answer is, well, the one who showed him mercy. The one who showed him mercy. It's a it's a powerful insight into, it gives actually one of the clearest descriptions in the Bible of what it means to show mercy to somebody. Because in that story, what did that, that Samaritan do? He, he provided health care for him, for the, for the man that was, was mugged. He bound up his wounds. He directly did it himself. He, he cared for him in, a, in that practical way. And then he also provided transportation to get to a place of safety and then provided lodging and then continued to continue to provide financial help. That's incredible mercy. Now, somebody with a gift of mercy might just notice those kinds of situations more. They might just be inclined just to see there's a a need there, there's a need there. Others without this gift might not notice those things as much. But but also they may seek to seek those things out. They may just say, I just want to find those opportunities to meet those needs. They're just, just looking for it all the time. And again, it's going to be something natural. There's going to be a natural sense of joy in doing this, and you're going to be more fruitful at it. Somebody with a gift of mercy is going to be more fruitful at seeing somebody helped in their time of greatest need. Mercy is about breathing life where there is death, where there is turmoil and difficulty, bringing the resurrection power of Jesus to a situation where somebody who was without hope now has hope. Somebody who was in a, you know, without resource now has resource. Now they're helped in some amazing way. I know I, I don't have this gift of mercy. Now, as, as Christians, we all need to show mercy. So I, I try to cultivate this gift in my life. I don't, I don't 
It's not, it's not a strong gift for me. I know that as I serve and as I choose to show mercy, I, you know, the Holy Spirit helps me feel those, those, those profound feelings of compassion for people. You start to really see people's circumstances. And you start to really have compassion and really feel that, that mercy. But it, for me, I've noticed it's like it, it doesn't come automatically. I, I, I do it more because I know I should do it. I know it's my duty to do it. And then as I do it, I, I see the blessing in it. Maybe that's the person who has the gift. They, they just feel that from the very beginning. It's just Those feelings are just there from the very beginning. I think back to a situation in my life many years ago when one of the leaders uh, in a church I was in before, big gift of mercy. He would work with um, the homeless and with drug addicts and just had a massive heart for, for that, uh, th- those people. And I remember one time he asked me, he said, hey, I've got this friend who uh, needs to, uh, he's, he's a heroin addict and he needs to break his addiction and we're going to help him do this. And so you know, we, just, we need some support, we need some manpower, we're going to stay with him. And as he's going through, you know, cold turkey or whatever, getting off of this drug. And so we, we need people to stay up through the night with him and help him th- with this. And, you know, I'd never done anything like that before. And I, it wasn't like I was, it was burning in my heart to say, oh, I just feel the, the gift of mercy coming on me to do this. I, but I agreed to do it because I was like, this sounds like a good thing to do. Like I was being asked to do it. So I took that step. And I was very aware this other leader I was with, like, I could just see the mercy exuding from them. Just, they're just... They just were burning for this person. They just wanted to help them as much as they could. And, it was, and, and through that process, I, I saw that person's need. I saw um, what a blessing it was for us to be there uh, for them and how we were really, really helping them uh, through this time and, and, and you know, choosing to do that. that way I saw God's blessing in that. And other times I've served at different things, I, I've, I've noticed, I, I see people serving in ways that you just see the mercy exuding out of them. They just, they just got such compassion for people, if that's your gift, what a gift. Because those of us who don't have mercy, we need you. We need you because you inspire us to, to be more merciful. Because it's so easy just to be like, well, that person's got their own problems. They just need to be more responsible. Or, and that's not untrue, but is that compassionate? You know. So we, we need you. We need that gift. We need that gift of helping. We need that gift of mercy. Now, what about the gift of giving? Gift of giving. Again, these gifts are not very complicated. They're very, the description's kind of obvious to us. The gift, gift of giving, this is about us taking of our own resources and sharing it with others. And, of course, again, all Christians, we're, we're called to be generous people, to, to give to those in need. Of course, we're, we're called to do that. But there's someone with this particular gift of giving, they perhaps give more consistently. Maybe they're the first ones to give. Maybe they're the, they're the kind of person that, you know, when someone gets up on a Sunday morning and starts talking about a new giving campaign, they're the kind of person that says, oh, great, an opportunity to give. They got the gift. And we see an example of this in uh, Romans 12, I think it is, verses 6 to 8. It says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, and the one who contributes in generosity. So that's it right there at the end, the one who contributes in generosity. So this can be referred to as the gift of contribution as well. And this is talking about giving money. We, we, well, there are other ways to be generous, right? There are other ways to, 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 to practice giving, of course, but, but this specific gift here is talking about giving of financial resource. And we, we, we have an example of this when you think about the, the widow. Jesus talks about the widow. He's watching people. If you remember that one story in the, in the Gospels where Jesus is watching people giving in the offering. I always want to do that. One Sunday, I'm just going to follow the basket around. One Sunday, I'm going to collect the offering. and I'm going to walk up to every single person. That's what Jesus did. I just want to be more like Jesus. And he's watching people put in, and you know, all the, all the religious people putting in large sums so everyone can see, making sure the coins are loud enough, you know, so everyone can hear how much they're putting in, ramming it in. And then this little, little old widow, she puts in, I think it's uh, Mark chapter 12. Yeah, the poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny, and it was all she had. And Jesus says she put in more than anyone. So all these people that put in all these large sums, Jesus is like, that doesn't really, doesn't really count. Even though it was more than what she gave, it's because 
it barely dented their wallets because they had a lot. But she, she was so generous. So this is the gift of giving. Now, of course, if you give possessions away, you give other resources, you have other objects you have, those things tend to have monetary value. So that's another way of contributing. That's another way of giving. It's still connected to finance because you're giving something that has financial potential to it. You could sell that thing. Or if you give it away and you don't have it, then you've got to buy a new one, right? So it's still connected to giving money. The other example is, you know, giving food. You give food away to someone. That's, food costs money. It's food you don't have. You have to buy more food for yourself, whatever, you know. It's still connected to giving off financial resource. Um, the other one, I guess, maybe is a little different is giving of time. You, know, you can be generous with your time, but I, I, I still think that could be tied to giving a financial resource because, you know, People say time is money, right? My, my time, I could be using my time to earn extra money or do things for myself. And it's actually in giving that, I'm laying down something. I'm giving up something that I have in order to bless somebody else. And at the heart of the Christian faith is the heart of generosity. You know, God gave everything, right? Jesus. At the heart of the Christian faith, Jesus laid down his life for us. And so we respond in that spirit of gratitude. And those are the gift of giving they, they particularly, and if you have this gift, you particularly know this. It's not about, see, see what you can't, you can't get confused. You can't think, oh, well, I can't have the gift of giving because I don't, I don't have that much money. That, that's not what this is about. That, that, that's a false way to understand this. You, you actually might be somebody who is, is without means, but you can have this gift because it's, it's about the impulse, it's about the, the, the heart, and the willingness to be generous and give to others. Jesus instructed us all to be generous in this way. Jesus talked about, in Matthew 20, 23, he talks about, to the Pharisees, about their, their tithing habits. And, you know, they had neglected the more important things of the law, the weightier things of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. They had neglected those things, but they had been very religious about their tithing. They were even tithing their, their mint and their, their dill and their cumin. And they, they'd been, been, been tithing their their herbs in their garden. That's how religious they were about tithing. And you say, well, you know, you shouldn't have neglected that, so that's good, but you've neglected more important things, which is to show, you know, show justice and mercy and faithfulness. And so in that, in that passage there in Matthew 23, Jesus is, is, is reminding us as all believers, hey, we're all called to be consistent at giving. We're all called into that. But beyond that, if you have the gift of giving, you're the kind of person that says, yeah, I get, I get the tithing thing. Hey, I, I get the, the special offerings that, that happen. But like, I'm going to give however and whenever I can. Even if it's only a little thing I can give. Somebody with this gift is, they're not trying to conserve things for themselves and trying to say, how can I keep as much for myself and do the bare minimum? I think the person, the kind of religious person or spiritual person is trying to always do the bare minimum has completely missed the point of faith in God and relationship with Jesus. Completely missed the point. The person with the gift of giving, though, understands, I'm going to go beyond this. I'm going to give however and whenever I can, even if I can only give a little bit, because I know that everything I have, God, God will supply all my needs. God will provide for me. I don't have to fear going without, because God has my back. As I'm generous, God will bless me and provide for me. Now, again, like with mercy and helping, you can have compassion fatigue. You, you want to be wise as it comes to giving, because, of course, we want to avoid debt. We want to avoid, you know, uh, putting ourselves in a position where others would, would have to help us unnecessarily. We want to avoid those things. We want, to be, we want to have wisdom with it, but we still want to honor the gift of giving and say, yeah, God's put it on my heart to be generous. So if you have the impulse to give, just be aware, just like someone getting a prophecy, someone receiving a, a dream from the Holy Spirit, somebody praying for the sick and seeing them healed. In the same way that you might get prompted or displaying the gift of faith, in the same way, if you get prompted to give, know that's the power of the Spirit helping you. And as we need you, because as you give, you inspire more giving. Now, again, we don't, we don't give to boast. We don't, give, you know, we don't want to be like those Pharisees in public giving to boast. But we can be confident that as we give, God will find a way to encourage others in that giving. God will find a way to do it. We're inspired to give. All these gifts, helping, mercy, giving, 
as we use our gifts, these gifts are for the common good. They build up the whole church. If you have any of these gifts used, please make sure you're maximizing using your gift because we need it. We need it. I'm pretty sure my wife has the gift of giving because she's always trying to give away my money. <laughs> I waited till she left the room to say that one. No, that's unfair. She, she's a very generous person, though. All right, let's look at the gift of administrating, this last one, this gift of administrating. This is a little different. And um, you know, we, we, we talked about all the power gifts. We talked about these serving gifts, right? The gift of, of administrating um, is the, the word here, we could be misled by it quite easily, actually. We've got to dig into the original language to understand what, what the Bible means by this particular gift, because this word means to govern, the word that's used here, to govern or to steer something, almost like a helmsman in directing the course of a ship, to steer, steer a ship or to guide and navigate a ship. So we have an example of this in 1 uh, Corinthians 12, verse 28. It says, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, which we looked at, then administrating. That's where it appears there, and then various kinds of tongues. So administrating, that's where it appears in the Bible, this gift. And when we hear the word administration, we might think, oh, this is about organization. Somebody who's administratively gifted, they are the kind of person that has a clean desk, they have the best spreadsheets, you know, that's what it means to administrate, right? And that is a gift. That's clearly a gift. Some people, maybe you're that way. Any administrators like that, organizational people? Come on, show your hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. We're going to make you come forward now. No. <laughs> That's not what the Bible means when it talks about the gift of administrating in this context. All right? So it's a little bit confusing. When it talks about administrating, it means it more at the kind of organizational leadership level. So um, almost like we would, you would talk about a certain president's administration, Right? You might say the current administration or the previous administration. That's the way it, it is using this gift. So it's talking about a leadership gift. And it, it, it says that these, the gift of administrating or leadership has been appointed in the church. So alongside apostles, alongside prophets, alongside teachers, this gift has been appointed in the church. And so this, again, it's not just about organizing things. It, or bringing order to things, it is about doing that. It is taking responsibility for things, but it's, it's a ministry-focused responsibility. So it's, it's not necessarily, it could include pastoring, or you know, those who are in a pastoral position. It could be broad enough that it includes those people, but it, I think it can be broader than that. It can be people in any kind of leadership role, essentially, in a church, or people who oversee an area of responsibility in a church. They're administrating that, those people that are in a part of that area of service in the church. And so some examples for us in our context, just to clarify this and make this clear for us what this is, like anyone who's a small group leader. So it's weird to think if you're a small group leader, like I'm an administrator, but in the spirit of this terminology, that's, that's, that's what's going on here. You're spiritually administrating the leadership of, of a small group, or you're, you're a small group assistant, or you're one of our serving team coordinators or our different serving teams on a Sunday, or you're, you're a director of a special ministry, or you're a coach, you're overseeing other leaders. These, these are, this, this, this is what this gift is talking about. We have some examples of people being appointed to leadership roles in the Bible. We have three uh, examples here. We're going to go through these. Any second now. First one, first example is Jesus appoints the 12 disciples. So it says he called to him those whom he desired, Mark 3.13. And the second example we have, <laughs> Jesus also appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him. And then the third one says, uh, this is Titus is told, put what remains in order and appoint elders. That's Titus 1.5. And actually another one just came to mind, which I forgot to add to the list, is where the Bible tells, uh, Paul talks about appointing what's called a deacon, or deacons um, in the church. And so we have these examples in the scripture of Jesus doing it, the disciples doing it, others doing it, where there are people are being appointed to leadership roles in the church. Now, not everyone is 
called or gifted to have an official leadership title. It's not everyone's going to do that, but it's important that we all value the gifts of leadership. We see the importance of them, how necessary, necessary they are, and how God has given them. And because gifts of leadership are given as an example to follow, that we actually seek to emulate the traits of leadership as well. That we value it and we seek to emulate it, even if we are not in a position of leadership ourselves. And the Bible points to this in a few ways. So in the New Testament, we're told to, church, church leaders are told to share ministry responsibility with the whole church. So it's in Ephesians 4, it mentions this, that you know um, we're to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So we're all called into, church leaders are called to share ministry responsibility with everyone. So it's always a bit of a negative when, when a church has a view that there are professionals that do ministry and then everyone else that just pays the professionals to do the ministry. Like that, that's a wrong way to look at church. Church should be, a, we're all sharing in the ministry. We all do play parts in the ministry. We've got our different gifts. And we're all participating in this ministry. We're, uh, we're being equipped to do it. We're also told we're, we're supposed to reign in God's kingdom. Reigning in God's kingdom is, you know, the, 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 there's an undertone there to, you know, royalty, actually. Now, it says we're, we're royal priests. Peter says that in another passage, right? That we're, we're a royal priesthood. That's a leadership role. To call to be a priest, that's a leadership role. Also, we're told we're going to judge angels. So, so some, we're going to be judges as well. That's a leadership role. And then also, Jesus, in a couple of um, different proverbs, um, or parables, excuse me, that Jesus, parables that Jesus speaks, he, he promises, he uses the illustration of, you're going to, based on your works, you're going to receive responsibility over certain cities in heaven. That means you're going to be a mayor in the future. You're going to be, be responsible over different cities. And that, that's another leadership role. So yes, in this life, we're not all called to occupy larger leadership level, you know, titles, but, we, we, but lots of people will. Not everyone will, but lots of people will. But we're all supposed to value that and emulate that. Now, I always get nervous when I start talking about leadership stuff in church because the last several decades of kind of like church culture in the United States and in other countries as well, have there was a, perhaps a wrong emphasis or a wrong explanation of what leadership actually is. So kind of like the Willow Creek seeker-sensitive version of leadership, unfortunately, had kind of a more of a, a business sense to understanding leadership. And in reaction against that, a lot of people say they just want to throw that stuff out and get rid of it all. The problem with that reaction against it is that, well, the Bible still tells us there's gifts of leadership, and it's important, and it functions a certain way. And so we have to value it and to want to emulate it. But we want to do that in, an, in the way that the Bible tells us to do it, not in the way that where there's been trends in church cultures at certain times. And so anyone who gets called up into a leadership role or a leadership responsibility might doubt it, actually. Might struggle with... Am, am I cut out for this? Am I cut out to actually be an example to others or take responsibility or have, have authority in a certain area? And this is very normal. With the gift of helping, I don't think people feel that way. I think people are like, I just want to help. The gift of mercy, you're like, yeah, it's fine. I just want to show mercy. With the gift of giving, you're like, yeah, I just want to give. But the gift of leading is a little different. It operates a little different because you can doubt your ability, ability to do it and especially in our day and age, we're very suspicious of people in positions of power, right? We distrust institutions, we just distrust leaders, we, we, we struggle with that, and, and in part because we've been, we, we've been so disillusioned, we, trust has been broken. You know, we trusted in things, people said stuff, we thought they were telling the truth, and we were... We believed it, and then we've been hurt by that, so then we don't trust anyone in a position of authority. But again, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We've got to understand this is, this is given for an important reason. God raises up leaders for very important reasons, that groups of people are naturally dysfunctional, are naturally they're gonna, there's going to be gossip, 
I mean, people like to gossip, right? It's tempting. I've gossiped. You ever gossip before? Does it, does, it, does it work out well? Never works out well. Let me just tell you if, you, ever, if you ever hear anyone in our church gossiping, put a stop to it right away. If you catch yourself doing it, put a stop, stop to it right away. If you ever hear of it, you put a stop to it right away. That's actually showing leadership. Groups of people, we, we, we're dysfunctional, we're fragile. We, we, can be so, we can so easily fall apart and, and struggle and so God gives the gift of leadership to bring safety, to bring security, and to bring order. The gift of leadership actually helps organize all the other gifts, helps release people into their gifting. That's why it's so valuable, so important. And we can be tempted with all these gifts of serving to think that they're perhaps less, less dramatic or less impressive as gifts of prophecy or gifts of healing or these dramatic gifts that we might have, these supernatural gifts. And we... But we've got to realize even the gift of leadership, that's a supernatural gift. Gift of giving, gift of helping, gift of mercy, these are supernatural gifts. Yes, praying for the sick and seeing someone healed, wow, what a powerful thing God might do. We want to see more of that. Wouldn't you like to see more of that? I'd love to see more of that. We'd love to see our daughter healed. That'd be amazing. God can do anything. I believe that. We'd love to see more of that. But we've also got to understand, as we're moving in the Spirit's power that it is miraculous to bring order out of chaos. It is a miraculous thing to... I mean, think about the person who is in need of mercy and they receive your mercy as you exercise the the, the act of mercy or the gift of mercy as you do that. That's going to feel pretty miraculous to that person, isn't it? That's going to feel like, wow, this is... God knew I needed this. Boom. That that supernatural power at work. What, What a testimony to that person of God's provision in that moment. Actually, the Bible spells it out like this in Exodus 35. It says, Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezael, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence. Look at that, would be great. Got the spiritual gift of intelligence with knowledge and with all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs, to work with gold and silver and bronze in cutting stones for setting and in uh, in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. The Bible couldn't be clearer. This is empowered. These are the service-oriented. These acts that we, 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 these gifts that we have, they're empowered by the Spirit of God. We've got to see that it it is the supernatural work of God working through us. Now, helping, mercy, giving, like I said, I think those gifts, they can need some encouragement, and I encourage you to practice those gifts if you have those gifts, but the gift of leading, I think that gift always needs more encouragement to come out. Because rightfully so, most people, you want to be cautious about, you don't, you don't want to assert yourself into a, into a prominent role, you know, that can feel a bit icky, right? And so it has it's something that has to be encouraged and coaxed out of people. Here's the reason that you should value growing more leadership traits in your own life. The blessing that God puts in you and the maturity that God grows in you, when you begin to lead, that multiplies to other people. It extends beyond yourself. And again, it's not about having a title, it's not about having a specific role, but it's about having that quality that says, I want to care I want to be concerned about the well-being of others, about the growth of others. About I want, to, I want to take on the responsibility to make sure those around me are maturing and growing as well. That's essentially what it means to lead, to lead an area of responsibility. In my own life, I was thinking about this, and kind of three things stuck out for me, my kind of journey with leadership. And what, what I realized was that people called me into leadership before I was ready for it. And that's an important principle, that if you wait till you're ready, you'll never be ready. And so it's actually important that you are given responsibility when, when you don't know how to do something, so that you learn, learning on the job is actually the best way to learn. That's what a true apprentice is. And so I was asked to join the leadership of a youth group many years ago now before I was ready for it. And then I was asked to be a camp counselor before I was ready for it. And I was, I was asked to plant a church before I'd even been an elder in a church before. Before I was even ready, I was, I was called into those things. And 
I'm so grateful that people took those chances on me. And we've got to remember that. If you're in a leadership role already, you've got to, you've got to remember that. I've got, I've got to call people before they're ready. I've got to call them into it. And if you're somebody who gets called into a responsibility and you're like, I'm not ready, you've got to realize, oh, that qualifies me for it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's what that means. It means I'm qualified for it. Second thing that stands out for me was how much people stuck with me. Because I, early on in, on this journey, I said some stupid things. I had a sense of entitlement. I thought I, was, thought I understood things better than other people. And I was, I was you know, insecure and immature in, in certain ways. And you might say, if you know me, you might say, Matt, that's still a problem. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm a little better. But I was so grateful. I think back, it's almost embarrassing some of the things I think about in my past, but um, how people who are older than me and wiser than me and, and were in positions of responsibility over me, how they stuck with me and they didn't give up on me and they kept believing in me and they were very patient with me and very gracious with me. They had to correct me at times, but they stuck, stuck it out. I, need, I needed that and that's true for anyone. Anyone that's being drawn into leadership, they need that so much. And then the third thing that stuck out to me was that these people, they told me that I could do it. They affirmed it in me. I remember one of my, a, a, a discipler of mine, a guy called Steve Whittington, a guy who dramatically changed the, the, God used him to change the course of my life. And I was in a really bad place and God used him to bring brought him into my life and really saw some gifting and saw some things in me and, and called it out and started changing the direction of my life, really. It was, it was an amazing, just God's grace in my life. And but Steve, I remember one time he said to me, he said, Matt, you clearly have a gift and we want to see that develop and see that grow, but it's going to take time to get there. And I remember I was blown away because no one had ever said to me, anything like that to me before. Like, I have a gift? You see something? Like, what? What is that? What does that mean? And it was, it was so affirming, so encouraging. And that's, again, if you're in a, lead, if you're in a leadership role, you've got to remember that. You've got to remember to speak that over people. Say, I see this in you. There's something, there's potential here. There's a, there's a gifting here. I see it in you. And also, if you're, if you're somebody who's not there yet, you're, you know, to be, to be seeking out those over you that you can learn from. Say, how can I grow more? How can I, you know, what do you see in me? Asking those questions. And it's so important that we don't compare our gifts to each other. It's so important that we learn to be joyful and accepting of our design, our personality, our character, our qualities, our skills, and, and we learn to find joy in shining that as brightly as we can, and being so grateful that, hey, that other person, those other people, they, they have those gifts. That's great. That's great. Maybe I'll grow a little bit in that, but that's obviously not a grace I have. They have that grace. Not to compare, but to celebrate, to find joy in it, to see that it's for the common good, for the common good. Let's think about Jesus. Let's think about how Jesus has done this in our lives. Jesus displays all these gifts to us. So in our time of greatest need, Jesus came and he helped us, right? We needed help, so much help, and Jesus came and he helped us. And we needed mercy, and what did Jesus do? He showed us all the mercy. We were without, we lacked resource. And what did Jesus do? He gave Everything we have comes from God. That's how we can return to him. That's how we can enter into a sacrificial offering. That's how we can tithe. That's how we can give to those in need because Jesus gave everything to me. But also Jesus came to us as a group when we were dysfunctional and disloyal, when we were gossiping and lying and harming each other and when we were fragile and disorganized and disorderly. And he came to us with his gift of leadership and he organized us together. And he said, I've, I've got a structure for you. I've got a plan for you. I've got a way to put you together. I've appointed different things. I've gifted you and I've appointed you together so that you can thrive, so that you can all be built up into my glorious church. And that's how Jesus came to us. And that's his kindness. He's got a vision for us. You know, Jesus has a vision for his church, to build his church together. If you're not using your gift in the church you're doing something wrong. You're doing something wrong. You might say, how do I get to use my gift in the church? Well, you go through growth track. That's what you do. You go through growth track. 
You also, you can talk to any leader and say, how can I use my gifts? How can I serve? How can I get involved? And the key to leadership really is, the first step is serving, right? People talk about that, about servant leadership. That, that's what is, leadership is, is, is not about, I have this title or this role or I'm important. It's about, how can I be a blessing? How can I, how can I impact other people's lives? How can I pour myself out for them? Because honestly, I've got to tell you, being in a position of responsibility can be thankless at times. Especially in ministry, it can be thankless at times. So any, any encouragements you want to send my way, please feel free to send them. No one's ever happy. And we complain at our leaders all the time, right? We do this, culturally we do this because politics has become our religion. So we're so mad at all our political leaders all the time because guess what? They lie and they, all the promises they make they can't come through on anyway. So we don't, we don't want to worry about what other people are doing. We want to be, take responsibility for ourselves, say, how can I take on responsibility? How can, I, how can I mature into the full person that God has called me to be? And how can I pour out more mercy? How can I pour out more helping? How can I pour out more giving? And how can I value leadership and grow those leadership traits, whether or not I have that leadership position? Because this is what Jesus has come to do and what he has done for us. And he did it on the cross. He did it on the cross. We're going to take communion in just a minute and talk more about what Jesus has done for us in his sacrifice. When you like and subscribe, this video reaches more people.